all the things you see around you were created by science and engineering together. Wealth. And the richest countries are those which are able to harness science in the most effective way. And one of our leading scientists, the ex-chairman of CSIRO, has said that for every dollar you invest, you get five dollars back through science, and quickly. It's not just in 20 years' time. So the first reason why science is vastly important for everybody is money, wealth. The second is quarantine. Now that sounds a bit strange, doesn't it? Keeping things out. And I don't just mean what happens at Sydney Airport where I landed on Monday evening where they ask you if you've got any food or something that can spread germs and bring down trees and infect cattle. I don't mean that sort of quarantine. I mean stuff that other countries have got that we might import for our society. And one of the things, for example, is what I took last night to help me stay awake during the day, having just come from Europe, which is nine hours different. What I need to do is take a little pill called melatonin, which is what you have in your bodies during the dark at night. It helps you sleep. It keeps you on the 24-hour cycle. And there's a different sort of hormone during the day which stimulates you. And I know, and various other scientists know, that if you take melatonin, then you turn your clock, your 24-hour clock, back to a normal setting when you've landed. If you take it just before you go to bed, as I said, it's the hormone that you need in the dark. But you can't actually buy it in Australia. Because some people think it does some sort of harm. And so our scientists and others are looking at melatonin to see whether it's something safe. And it's taking years. I get mine from any drugstore in America. You buy it for six bucks. You get a jar of a couple of hundred. And when you go back to another place, you take a pill and you feel fine. But that is an example of the kinds of things like the new technology and all sorts of Things like um, Murdoch-style journalism. All sorts of things that we might not necessarily want in our country. So science looks at the way systems and drugs and products might be introduced to a country like this one or your country if you come from elsewhere. Quarantine is the second reason you need to have science, people who understand what's being done overseas. The third reason to do science is to tell you who you are and who you are not. When I first came to Australia in 1964, um, it was just generally assumed that, uh, oh, previously, a few hundred years ago, it was a kind of empty land. Yeah, there are a few people wandering around, but they'd been here for oh, a couple of thousand years. A bit like New Zealand. People have been in New Zealand for about 800, 900 years, maybe a thousand, very recently. Mind you, in that time in New Zealand, they wiped out most of the megafauna. <laughs> Didn't take them long. These gigantic birds called moas, all gone. And so I sat back in 1964 thinking, well, Aboriginal people have been around in this country for a very short time. And then discoveries began to happen partly based on this very university, partly based on the Australian National University. And now, people think that Aboriginal people have been here for 50,000 years. Having a continuing culture for 50,000 years is spectacular. How then can you view your country if you know people have been here for a long time before you, if you're not an Aboriginal person, or a short time. So it changed the way Australians viewed their country. It changed the law. Science did that. Gave a completely different picture of who people are in this country. And the same goes for men and women. 
Even in the 19th century, people like Darwin were writing in their books about human beings that maybe if you weren't a European type or if you weren't a male, your brain wasn't as good as if you were. He didn't do the experiments like a good scientist should to find that out, but he wrote it down if you look at his books about the nature of human beings. Of course, you can test that and you discover that all people, everyone in this room, is from the same species. It might have been the case that they could be different species. Who knows? Uh, somewhere in Flores, you might have various hobbits still living somewhere in a cave, in which case we'll have to reprogram our ideas. At the moment, there's no question, we're all one species. And men and women have the same brain capacity but between ourselves, the females do far better at university and school, don't they? Especially in this country and, and Britain. Anyway, um, it tells you who you are, which is a vitally important thing. Because up to the time of modern science, people had prejudices about men, women and other races which were completely wrong. The third reason for doing science for everybody is democracy. Need I tell you about some of the debates we're having around the world? Certainly here about climate, about the environment, totally based on scientific ideas. People are actually telling lies about science. And the policy that we decide on for our future is going to be affected by that. <laughs> The fourth reason to communicate science and understand it, whether you're a brilliant science student like yourselves or someone on the outside, is the future of the nation and how we deal with it in terms of governance. The fifth reason to do science, and frankly the one that turns me on every day, is it's fantastic fun. Now my daughter happened to choose arts, but when she was deciding as to whether <laughs> Children do that. <laughs> That's all right. She became a glass artist. She's got more degrees than I have. Real ones, not ones they give you free for being old. Uh, but before she enlisted at the University of Sydney to do arts, uh, she went to the Barrier Reef, to Lizard Island, and spent three weeks working with PhD and overseas people looking at the way the marine system works. And the thing that she had not quite thought of that struck her overwhelmingly, she said, Dad, it's real. Whether the fish know their names or not, the technical names or the Nemo names, <laughs> those fish, that reef, that weather, that system, that geology is absolutely real. It's not like the law, it's not like business where we make it up and get it sort of vaguely right or, or wrong or something. Nature, this is something that you can kick and which you can come and test and which is always there and it's the basis of you and everything else. And, okay, she went on to do fine arts, but the basis of her art, her glass art, has been what she's seen in the oceans, the marine aspect as well. Um, there's a sixth reason to do science, which I might come to later and you might talk about, and that's perhaps to save the world. But when I talk about my daughter and the choice of doing science or not, the interesting thing these days, and it's what I stand for, is that when you've done a science degree, you can do anything. I happen to be a journalist. Uh, my colleagues, my, my, my partner, became a television reporter. You can see her on Catalyst, if you happen to live in this country, on Thursday. I don't know whether she's on tonight, 8 o'clock. Do you watch television, you guys? <laughs> no? You've got some sort of funny device you take out of your bum and sort of... Very strange. Uh, th those of us who work in television know, of course, that you can actually see the stuff through any device, online and whatever, 
and Jonica did a vet's degree and actually treated animals and then thought, this is not what I want to do, I want to communicate actually science. And so she became a reporter. People can use a science degree to go into f commerce, to go into the law. Several people I know quite well, practicing lawyers, have done science. A number of leading people in this country have been great lawyers who first did science. So it seems to me that science degree involvement is the basis for almost anything. Let me tell you now about what I did as a person landing actually for the second time. Oh my God, are we being invaded by the Daleks again? <laughs> <laughs> you don't touch anything these days, even here. Uh, I came back to Australia having done a degree in Britain in 1972. And 1972 was a very interesting time for two reasons. One of them was we were doing things then that probably to you seem unbelievably old-fashioned, but we thought some of the most exciting things in the world. There were two of them that year, one in May and one in December. And it was the last one in December, and it was called Walking on the Moon. People actually went in those days and walked around on the moon. And my first job was to prepare the coverage on ABC Radio and to some extent television of those astronauts. It was unbelievably exciting. And in some ways it still is. Imagine someone tomorrow actually getting into a rocket with 100,000 different parts, all of them chosen by tender as to which is the cheapest or most convenient one that you can put into. If one goes wrong, <laughs> and there you are sitting on top of the rocket, and you're flying for several days, and you land on an out outer body. I find that extraordinary. I was cynical about it at the time, for various reasons. We say, oh, it's just the US military, and it's, it's something that uh, doesn't concern me. But when it was happening, when they were landing, when they found that the, on the first, in 1969, the first uh, Apollo 11 landing on the moon, that the rocket had been programmed in the wrong way and was going too fast, and they were scooting over where they should have landed, and here was a rocky bit. Is it going to happen? And the guy, Armstrong, took over the controls and drove it a bit like a helicopter with no lights and landed it in a special place. I mean, this was fantastic, heroic stuff. And then in December, Apollo 17, the last one that, that happened, covered that as well. On air, live, hour after hour. And that's the first time I actually went for any length of time on air. Uh, they said, OK, you go in, here's the microphone, Here's the nation, talk to the people, um, learn how to shut up when they're actually doing some interesting things actually on the moon and saying what they are. Uh, learn how to connect with the expert and tell you what they've just done. And I had no training. You just did it. And that was a very interesting experience indeed. Let me remind you of those times in my, this is, oh no, I'm not that old. I'm old enough, but I'm of an age when, in 1972, when I started that, there was no colour television in Australia, there were no ATMs, there were no CDs, there wasn't an internet, there were no mobile phones, thank God. <laughs> I've never owned a mobile phone. Nobody had ever heard of AIDS. There were no DVDs, there were no video machines, totally different kind of world. And the reason I mention that, partly because they're products of science and quantum physics, but partly because it gives you an idea of the rate at which the world is changing. Unbelievably quickly, in half a lifetime, all those things have appeared and now you guys 
presumably take them for granted. So the first thing I did as a broadcaster was cover those Apollo missions. And it's timely to think that uh, the shuttle is marking another end of a chapter of that kind of adventure in space. Of course, this week is the last mission, as you know. At that stage, we were doing radio and we were doing television. Very simple division of media. And I did less television because you have to be vaguely well-dressed. And you have to have all that equipment. When we were filming in London last week, there was enough equipment to fill half of this bench carried by two guys. Even now, you have to have unbelievable amounts of stuff. Whereas if you do radio, you take a little device out of your pocket, you interview somebody, and you go away. It's wonderfully simple and straightforward. And we did programs on radio about science as if they were part of everybody's everyday life. And we also did them as journalists. Now, when I go to some of the other countries, like China, and certainly like India, and I talk to some of their broadcasters about how they do things, it turns out that what we do is quite different from their tradition. If you talk to their broadcasters about science, they're talking about teaching. You know, it's part of education broadcasting. You talk about, this is a benzene ring, this is a koala, this is another koala, <laughs> this is a fossil. Whereas what we do, you've got one, excellent. <laughs> Let me see, what kind of koala is that? <laughs> it looks like a dead one, yeah. Could you tell me why it was that they have a pouch pointing downwards? Why, why would it be, why would nature organise a koala with a pouch pointing down there? I mean, the babies would fall out, surely. Anybody know the answer to that? I know you do, but... <laughs> When they climb, they don't get stuff in it. Is that what you said? That it, when they, well, you're half right, actually, because the yes. They wouldn't fall down because they don't stand up upright. <laughs> My koalas do. Um, <laughs> when they, they're very. I, I've seen them racing around, and sometimes they're very quick and they do stand upright. But the answer is straightforward evolution. They came from ground-based creatures, rather like uh, wombats, which would dig holes. And if you've ever seen a wombat do that, and if you're there in the pouch, possibly looking out, you're going to get an awful lot of gravel in your teeth. Therefore, um, most creatures like that evolutionary line have got their pouches pointing yeah. downwards. That's just a segue, you know, the fun part, number five, reasons for doing science. Um, the, the interesting bit. But I was talking about the ways in which we covered aspects of science as journalists, so that what we're trying to do is ask, why is this important and why are people switched on to this topic at the moment? There are various topics that one can look at. I've mentioned the shuttle. This week, uh, there are various others. Who can suggest something that's possibly topical this week that I might have covered in a program? Do you go in for topicality? Do you read newspapers? No? Could someone suggest to me just one topic that might be important? There was a discussion of a malaria drug yesterday. Hendra virus, yes, very worrying. Now, people on the front can give me the answers. What I want to know, see, a journalist will look for something which is a news peg, and we assume that everyone else in the world who's interested in what we do are interested because they can think, ah, I've heard of that, that's been in the papers, that's been on the news. But if you're not reading the papers or listening to the news, 
how do I know what you think is current and topical and important? Maybe that's something to think about. What I assume, however, when I'm making a program is that I will take the, the, the normal kind of pegs, news pegs or levers or whatever you call them, that a journalist would do and put something on that week because I think that will make people realise why it's there. You know, why should I put anything on the radio or television at a particular time and grab people's attention? If people think it's irrelevant or stupid or what's that got to do with me or never heard of it or who cares, you will not get people listening to radio programmes or science programmes or even blogging. It'll be irrelevant to them. But if they understand why it's there, it has that ping factor. So, I've been doing that for, for the science show for 35 and a half years. I started the science show in Canada in August 1975. I did several, I thought, extraordinary interviews for that first program. And one of the items was with somebody called Lord Ritchie Calder, who's actually from Britain, a Scotsman, who told me about his concerns about climate change. He said, we're extremely worried that all the burning of fossil fuels going to the atmosphere is changing the climate, and we've been discussing this since 1961, and people aren't taking it seriously, and here we are in 1975, and it's now a matter of urgency, he said 35 years ago. Isn't it amazing? I think it's amazing. All that time ago, and in many programs since, we have discussed matters like that. And here we are, half a generation on, and we're still going on about the same things. So another thing we talked about was the energy crisis. Oil, coal, <laughs> the fact that it's costing so much, uh, the fact that people are having to choose about transport. Talking about that in 1975. And so it's interesting to go back to see how people were looking at various issues. One thing that I did, which I suppose was a bit naughty, but this was a time in the mid-70s when people were vaguely hippie, vaguely flaky. And so it was easy to get their attention, I talk about topicality, by doing stuff that was vaguely magical. Now, I interviewed a guy actually at Stanford University in the United States about energy channels in the body and how you can put hands on and release those energies and get miracle cures and how this will be the greatest revolution since the Greeks. And, of course, it was what we call in Australia bullshit. <laughs> because when I asked for evidence, he had none. He just said, it happened. But I got the most gigantic audiences. And so every now and then I'd put another person on. In fact, there was a physicist from this very department called Brian. You're putting your hands over your face? <laughs> a person specialising in quantum physics who talked about the psychology of the universe and connecting to some great outer spirit. I put him on a couple of times as well. Levitation as well, that's right. You, you t teach people how to levitate. Uh, there was also a person who, in fact, had been a great botanist at Clare College in Cambridge, who talked about morphic resonances. Have anyone heard of morphic resonance? Do you have one here? Have you got a morphic resonance? You don't have one. Well, you, you, you might acquire one. His name is Rupert Sheldrake. And his idea was that when something happens for the first time in the universe, it can happen again. So if you took a bunch of rats and put them in a maze here, that looks like a maze, yeah, and they learned, because you put some food at the end of the maze, how to negotiate it faster, 
as a result of their doing it once. Tomorrow, in China, in Shanghai, in another laboratory, rats would also do it faster. Because the universe has some sort of memory, a resonance. And a friend of mine said rather sardonically, if that's the case, why don't all people talk Chinese? <laughs> think about it, think about it. Anyway, um, just to give an example of the, a story attached to some of the naughty things we've done. Uh, on one occasion, I was doing another program in the morning, which is a current affairs program, and I was told that Rupert Sheldrake was going to be on the program, and that he'd been working with a friend of mine from the Open University in Britain called Professor Stephen Rose. And they had been working on chicks, which had been hatched from eggs. And they'd been trained to do something, not exactly a maze, but some very simple operation. And as they trained them to do it, the next batch of chicks could do it faster and better. And so each generation, well, not wasn't a generation, each new batch of chicks that they examined were better at doing this particular performance. So I said, I actually know Stephen Rose. I shall phone him tomorrow morning. This is a friend of mine telling me that uh, this was going to happen, not actually Sheldrake. So I phoned Stephen Rose in Oxford, where he was, and I said, Rupert Sheldrake says he's been doing this work with you, that uh, he's proved that there is a morphic resonance so that, um, you know, these animals can learn things faster. He said, yeah, we did the experiments, and they didn't work. I said, well, he's about to say to Australians on live radio that they did. <laughs> Would you be prepared to be in the program? So the next day, I go on air at 10 o'clock, or 9.30, till uh, 11, and Rupert Sheldrake comes in, wonderfully serene guy, he's very charming, as I said, a super botanist, and he tells me this stuff about the morphic resonance and the memory of the universe, and how he'd been working with Stephen Rose, and I said, would you mind if we asked Stephen Rose that? Got him online, it was quite late at night in Britain, fairly early morning in Australia, and Stephen said, when I asked him why I was doing work with uh, Rupert Sheldrake, he said, well, being a person who's anti-establishment and makes all the authorities very cross, he must have something good going for him. So I said, yes. And I said, did your experiments work? He said, no. <laughs> At which point Rupert Sheldrake went to funny colour <laughs> and they started arguing thing was, very interestingly, after the program, I got attacked for ambushing Rupert Sheldrake. And I said, how could I justify telling an audience something I knew not to be true? Should I do that? I know it's very entertaining, but should I do that? As a matter of interest, at a conference in Rome, just a few weeks afterwards, somebody from the University of Cambridge was asked to adjudicate the results of the experiment and found, yes, according to Stephen Rose, there was no effect shown. But make no mistake, as you probably know, if you want to be very, very famous and get an awful lot of money, go for some of this fringe stuff. Everybody wants to know about it, and it's so straightforward getting attention. Everyone's got a body, therefore complementary drugs are of tremendous interest because you can go out and buy them yourself. You don't have to go to a boring doctor to do hundreds of tests. You can be in charge of your own health destiny. But eventually, I gave that stuff away. I realised that it was somewhat irresponsible. And the reason I did so was somebody who came into the studio, this is way back at the end of the 70s, and he did something called past lives therapy. He could take you and by hypnosis, 
take you to the person you had been in a previous life. And you could then explain what you did, and he could show that it was something about your experience in that past life that is giving you trouble at the moment, and that would be fine and make a lot of money. And that. So I had him in the studio, and he brought his secretary, who apparently was very good at responding to these sorts of uh, stimulations. And within maybe five seconds, she was this other person somewhere else. And I said, where are you? She said, I'm on the planet Zog. <laughs> Is that in our own solar system? No, it's a long way away. And where are you? I'm on a space station. What is it like? It's, it's, it's very big. I said, yeah, well, go on. She said, it's very, very big. <laughs> and that's how she proceeded. That's all the information we got. And I thought, this is a complete waste of time. If you can't have the imagination, at least to give us something from the first ten minutes of the average Doctor Who film, <laughs> with a bit of a, a big... <laughs> Lots of things are big. Go away. <laughs> but then I turned to a few things that um, were also a bit naughty and weren't, do weren't being done for self-indulgence. I ran a number of hoaxes. And some of them were based on this very university. A person who was in the Department of Italian called Fred May, long past, you know, a brilliant actor, a person of the most amazing talent. He ran the Sydney University Dramatic Society as well. And I wanted him to be somebody called Sir Clarence Lovejoy, who's a person I made up. He had two Nobel Prizes and was an expert in something called brain flux theory. And this was a way in which you could actually have a modular understanding of the way the brain works. The pons ponderosus was the centre of pondering. And the lobus levitatis was the centre of humour. And Gertrude in the laboratory just down here lent Sir Clarence his hat pin. And there on the bench was a rat with its brain exposed. And Sir Clarence put the pin into the lobus levitatis and the rat started to laugh and then into the pons ponderosus and it folded its paws and began to ponder <laughs> and we put that on the radio and people believed it <laughs> myself and Fred went on to about six different programs what does a, what does a rat sound like when it laughs? a bit like a vice chancellor <laughs> You know when they say we're cutting back the funds for this department? <laughs> they like the Daleks in Doctor Who. Okay, so the reason we put on those hoaxes, and I did uh, any number, like the... Um, the live coverage of the birth of Princess Diana's first child three months before it happened. <laughs> it just happens to be that the person who was chairman of the ABC at the time was the vice-chancellor of this university, Leonie Kramer. And she was asked by the world's press how she could defend something so outrageous as my having a team, supposedly, there were a bunch of actors and people who were supposedly covering the birth of Princess Diana's first child. Uh, we did a number of other hoaxes, um, and, and on and on they went, mainly to show to the audience that you have to be sceptical about what you're hearing. Because someone's supposed to be a professor, you need not believe everything that is said, or anything that is said for that matter. And when you have people running around the country, especially here, talking about aspects of climate change, is it absolute crap, as one leading politician has said? Is it proven? Do you take some of this information 
simply as it's provided. I was rather disturbed when I saw the Prime Minister of this country on television on Monday being confronted with someone who said, we are terribly confused about climate change. We don't understand it. It hasn't been made... We've been discussing it for 50 years. What is, what is difficult about looking up stuff and finding from any source reliable material which will help you make up your mind? Why is it a matter these days of people thinking of themselves not as citizens but as, as consumers of everything, as if you're going to a supermarket and you're buying everything including ideas as if it must only fit your own preconceptions. I have a particular ideology. I will take science that looks like that. So I did hoaxes to try to expose that kind of preconception. I also did quite a lot of television. As you heard, we did Nature of Australia. And it's a vehicle of some of the changing times that we have that that was an extraordinarily famous series about Australian natural history. It matched, to some extent, David Attenborough's film series Life on Earth and that immensely ambitious project. Uh, the reason I mention the changing times is that whatever the impact, and we had 8.2 million people watching in Britain when it was first broadcast, let alone the world audience and it's still being sold all these years later over 20 years later on DVD and so forth we have closed the natural history unit of the ABC we don't do that anymore I find that shocking in 1987 we did World Safari as you mentioned and that was an extraordinary thing it was f terribly moving for us you probably take it for granted now that you can see cricket matches going on in any country live, just like that. But what we had to do was have 15 countries, starting in Canada with Dave Suzuki, and going to the United States, then going to India with Rajiv Gandhi talking about tigers, and going to China to talk about cranes. And we ended up with me and a guy in New Zealand who was last, he was talking about albatrosses, showing their mating. I was deeply shocked. Somewhere on the South Island of New Zealand. But what I had to do was go to Tidbinbilla, which is just outside Canberra, which happened to be the tracking station for the Apollo moon shots. But uh, on that day for World Safari, what I had to do for 4 minutes and 47 seconds exactly, live, was to talk about kangaroos and how we study their behaviour, how they reproduce, having one in the pouch, one on standby, and one coming later. You know, they've got three offspring, more or less, on the go at any one time. Uh, but we also, as David Attenborough asked me, live via satellite, why we eat our national symbol and why we kill about four and a half million kangaroos a year every year that happens to be the program I'm making this coming Saturday about the future of meat in the world how we're going to feed the world when we have so much greater population we're going to have to double our production of meat and yet animals use more water, energy, and land than any other source of food. And they provide less value in terms of nutrition. How is it going to work? Going back to that day in 87, we had to be on location at 5 in the morning to match world time for the live broadcast. And it was dark, and it was cold. And there was my log on which I would be standing, and there were the camera crew, and it started to rain. And so the camera people had to have their tarpaulin on top, and all I could see were these little Dalek-like lenses looking out at me. 
and behind me were the kangaroos. And the first thing they did, of course, was piss off. It was raining. They went for shelter. And so when the time came for me to talk, instead of saying, these kangaroos, <laughs> it's called show business television, I said, David, you, you should have been here yesterday. <laughs> and he laughed wonderfully. And that kind of live television then, linking 15 countries, was the most moving thing, showing how much we had in common in terms of environment and in terms of uh, common values. So that was a moving thing. Let me just wind up before I... Uh, for some questions about how we do this stuff. I talked about the changes since 1972 with all those different apps that you've all got. The only one I've got is this, which is something I get from Radio Shack for 25 bucks. It's got an on switch and an off switch, and it gets radio. And you listen to the radio as you walk along or when you sit in taxis, when they've got commercial stuff on with Alan Jones. The first thing I heard in the taxi when I landed from London was Alan Jones talking to Tony Abbott about climate. It was a nightmare. <laughs> so, that's my only app. And it's the only one I'm gonna have. Because the essence of science communication, whatever devices you use, whether you're tweeting them for very short numbers of words or having them extensively on a big blog or a book or using any kind of electronic imagery, the thing that matters, ideas and words. You have to have one big idea and concentrate on that and use clear, intelligible words. The writing is essential. And that way, when you concentrate on those two things, ideas and words, you can do it anywhere. You can do it for your local student magazine. You can do it for your local radio station. Anything. And if you want to communicate science, which is essential, it seems to me, for anyone in your field, that's how you start. And you can start this afternoon. What I sometimes do as a visiting professor at whichever university is talk to a number of people like yourself and say write me four minutes or five minutes on something that you really are excited about in your field and I will then have a session which I can't do with you I'm afraid perhaps one day a session of seeing whether that thing works and if you want to know how it's best done listen to my program you can do it anywhere in the world We've got some of the highest podcasting ratings from Australian networks, he said, with hubris, but happens to be true. See how it's done, and if you want to do it yourself, where you go. Send me an email, we'll record it, put you on the radio. Pay you 100 bucks. That's how we did it, so that there is a product, there is practice, and if you're keen to do it, you will find that that sort of skill, when you go for a job or hire in your academic career, that is taken notice of very much. Uh, for instance, next August the 4th, I'm going to the University of New South Wales, where people doing their PhDs will have a competition summarizing their PhDs in three minutes. They stand up and they've got to explain why it's important and three minutes is the cutoff point. Some people do it in a scheme called fresh science in this country where you hold a sparkler and you light the sparkler and you've got to hold it till it goes out or burns your fingers and say what you do and why it's important in just those short number of words. And that's the essence of doing stand-up television. That's the essence of being able to write a script for radio or doing something for a printed word. And that kind of communication, it seems to me, is essential for everybody. You can do it in all sorts of different ways. And I've kept an open invitation to people to do so. Uh, one of them, actually, 
was at the Australian National University doing his PhD many years ago, and I wanted a particular talk. And the Vice Chancellor was supposed to be an expert in that field. It was about Priestley, the chemist. Sorry, chemist, not physicist, but so, you know, he, he did physics as well. And eventually the uh, Vice Chancellor said, I'm sorry to have kept you waiting for you know, six months. Ask Alan. Alan did it the following day. I was amazed. A tape turned up. He'd actually completed it. So I said, you ought to do this again. And he did. And, of course, then we hired him. And he's been a broadcaster on air, Alan Saunders, for the last 25 years. You never know where it's going to lead. Whether you get into an organisation like the ABC or whether you just do it because you're interested as a part-time thing, as many people from this department, like Ian Johnston, from this department of physics did uh, on the history of physics and music, an entire six-part series. So you never know where it's going to lead. So thank you very much, and I'll answer your questions as you see fit.